Museum Association uh, monthly lecture. This is August the 26th, 2020, and we're doing a webinar in the, in the new new uh, way of, of giving presentations and reaching out. Uh, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing our, our speaker tonight, Professor Jonathan Winkler, uh, history professor and chairman of the history department at Wright State University, and a very knowledgeable person on Cold War. And tonight he's going to give a uh, lecture on the uh, ramifications of the uh, atomic uh, weapons use 75 years ago. And I lost my exact title, but uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Winkler will start. So enjoy. At the end of the presentation, I will uh, come back and, and give a, a, a little closing. If all possible, remember to turn off your uh, speakers and, and your own video, and we can focus on Professor Winkler's presentation. So with that, uh, let's uh, listen to the presentation. Thank you. All right. So thanks very much, everyone, uh, for coming. And I'll ask for your patience here while I I get the uh, ability to share my information here in my screen. And uh, just want to make sure that we get some feedback that uh, you guys can all see this. All right, Harry, can you give me a confirmation? Everybody can see the, uh, see the slides there? Not yet. Okay. How about now? Good now? You're coming up now. Very good. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank you all for joining me on this evening. Um, I would have preferred to do this face to face, as I think you all can, can imagine. But under the circumstances, it's the best we can do. And so I really appreciate the hard work of everybody to, to pull this together. Uh, certainly my first uh, electronic uh, presentation uh, to, to, the, uh, to the general public here. Thanks very much, Bob, for organizing this. Thanks very much, Harry and Jackie and the others uh, for helping to pull this all together. The staff and the volunteers at the museum are doing some really good work down there. My talk this evening is on the consequences and legacy of the atomic bombings of 1945 from a perspective of 75 years later. And as I, as I was uh, putting together this lecture over the last week, I read that a minister of state in Pakistan warned India uh, that should ever war occur, conventional war is not an option, and that Pakistan would use nuclear weapons to defend itself. Now, this was not a new threat, but that it came up once again and attracted international attention. So then, uh, two days later, it ceased to be the major international news and retreated back into the background noise. Now, to have suggested in 1945 two pieces of what was then Britain's most iconic colony would someday both possess more powerful forms <clears throat> of what then only the United States controlled and be threatening one another with them would have been in the realm of science fantasy. So what a long road we have traveled to reach to such a point. So to paraphrase the famous philosopher David Byrne, how did we get here? What I want to do is explore what easily could be a semester long course and uh, could easily be a book, uh, could easily be something treated at a very a complicated level that could go on for hours and hours and hours. But really, I think in order to do it, um, uh, firm justice in the time that we've got can be can be looked at really in, in three different areas. The commitment to nuclear weapons in the United States as a legacy of the use of the atomic bomb, the impact of nuclear weapons on international affairs, and then the lasting legacy of the nuclear option in ways that still we think about and are concerned about today. So those those three areas I want to take a look at over the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes or so. I also appreciate that some of you were in the middle of all of this. And so for, for some of you, what you're going to see here, people say, yes, yes, I appreciate that. Uh, what I want to do is to stitch together a larger retrospection to look at the 75 years and think in big terms. And for those of you who uh, for whom this is all completely new, to keep in mind the fact that it's very easy for things that are still within the living memory of, of those who are alive can very easily and quickly be forgotten about, uh, driven out, 
by other more pressing and contemporary things. But a lot went on, an awful lot went on, and it's very easy for us to, to forget that when the physical aspects of that are gone from our purview in, in ways that, that may surprise some of you here tonight. All right, so first I want to talk about this commitment to nuclear weapons on the part of the United States. <clears throat> And what I want to do also is move my slides forward. So there we go. Good. Now I got that all worked out. Now, following World War II and the use of the atomic bombs against Japan in August of 45, the United States makes the air-delivered atomic bomb the center of its offensive capability. It's a true strategic weapon. It supplants the pre-war metrics of numbers of battleships or numbers of mobilized men and divisions and ground forces. The National Security Act of 1947 creates an independent air force, and by 1948, the Strategic Air Command has the nuclear mission, and its commander will be General Curtis LeMay, who will then implement a major overhaul of the air force to maximize the focus and efficacy of this nuclear capability. Absent any other serious threats, the planning centers on the possibility of war with the Soviet Union. Such a war would be an air war against industrial centers a more powerful version of the form of total war that had been seen in 1944 to 1945. The atomic weapons would offset the massive Soviet military, its ground forces, its air forces. The bombs would give the United States the decisive advantage. By 1949, Plan Off-Tackle envisions a U.S. response to Soviet invasion of Western Europe with strikes on over 104 Soviet cities, using 220 atomic bombs delivered in a very, very short period of time. Soviet casualties are estimated to be 7 million, with 28 million likely displaced. What had taken years to accomplish against Germany through the assemblage of an air force and then the preparation of the ability to attack Germany itself would be accomplished in a matter of weeks, if not months, against the Soviet Union from a ring of bases that the United States possessed around the periphery of the Soviet Union. The Soviets, for their part, would not be able to reach the United States with their bombers. Prior to 1949-1950, they did not possess atomic bombs that could damage the United States or its allies. By 1950, the United States possessed over 500 atomic bombs and at least 264 nuclear-capable aircraft. That could, launching from here in the United States or these bases around the periphery, attack the Soviet Union and deal this just enormous destruction in a short period of time. But with the Soviets acquiring the bomb in 1949, the United States begins research on a larger device, the super or thermonuclear device, out of a fear that the Soviets will likely pursue that as well. Indeed, we know that the Soviets had already begun to research it. And so the Soviets can be expected to build up their own arsenal. The United States will have to continue to build its. And the 1950s sees the beginnings of an arms race in offensive but also defensive means within the nuclear age. <clears throat> now, for those of a certain age, the offensive tools are stunning, as was the job that they were expected to do. First came the aircraft. And for those of you who are familiar with the Air Force Museum, one of Dayton's gems, of course, you can go and see these aircraft. But so often when I talk about this to undergraduates, they're unfamiliar with the sheer scope and the, and the quantity of these devices that we construct. So the World War II era B-50 and B-36 bombers are replaced by the jet-powered B-47 and B-52. Factories across America begin to crank them out in larger and larger and larger numbers. They're able to deliver atomic and then thermonuclear bombs aimed at Germany, East Germany, Russia, China, North Korea. The United States expected to deliver these weapons all around the world compared to what had been envisioned as limited places in the war against Germany and against Japan. By 1956, the U.S. has 340 intercontinental and over 1,300 intermediate range bombers and the war plans become successively more and more and more complicated. Mid-air refueling, reconnaissance, and specialized supersonic aircraft that will punch through Soviet air defenses all become important as well. There are missiles with the information gathered from Germany's research, with the German scientists who were here in Dayton, among other places, 
the U.S. slowly makes its gains. The Soviets appear to be there first. The 1957 Sputnik success, this gives rise to a great fear that the Soviets will have something that will negate the American air-delivered advantage, that the United States will have to develop its own, that if this is not done right, the Soviets might be able to strike the United States first, might even be able to strike the United States first at the beginning or even before the beginning of a war and knock the United States out of the war altogether. Or the second time in a generation the U.S. might very well be vulnerable to a surprise first attack. And so this new fear accelerates in the late 1950s. There's a fear that the United States is losing. It must catch up again. So President Eisenhower is able to navigate through this. The decision is made to come up with a stopgap intermediate system before the United States can fully develop the intercontinental weapons that they are afraid the Soviets will develop. And we have here <clears throat> the two major systems that are built, these intermediate range ballistic missiles, the Thors and the Jupiters. And the Jupiters famously will be staged in Europe famously in Turkey, and we'll be seeing the Jupiters again in a little bit. <coughs> Sorry. Eventually, the intercontinental ballistic missiles are developed. Again, this may be old hat to some of you, but for others, the appreciation here should be on how big these things come to be until microelectronics are developed and the systems can become smaller and, and more easily constructed. We'll begin to have the Atlas and the Titan missiles will be following these up with the Titan II and then finally the Minuteman. Concerns about navigation, concerns about accuracy lead these missiles to have successively larger and larger and larger warheads so that by the end of the 1960s there are at least 120 of them equipped in the largest with nine megaton warheads designed to simply smash the targets that they are sent against military or cities. The successor is this much smaller Minuteman system, available from 1962 onwards. Fully 800 of these smaller missiles are deployed across the Central and Upper Great Plains, each equipped with a smaller yet still spectacularly powerful 1.2 megaton warhead. As accuracy improves, warhead size decreases, and the ability to control the systems as they move through space and back down to their target improves, the United States expects to be able to do greater and greater damage to the Soviet Union and will be able to rely less and less on the manned bomber. And now we can't explore it in full detail here, but in parallel with the construction of all of these aircraft and the construction of all of these missiles, we also have the construction of an enormously complicated system to produce the warheads. And these involve parts of Ohio, as many of you know. The piked and gaseous diffusion plant, for example, the mound laboratories, of course, and then, <clears throat> often forgotten, the Fernald Feed Materials Production Facility. Not forgotten for those who used to go to camp nearby um, and were concerned for a period of time in their childhood that they might have been somehow um, turned into being able to glow in the dark or something like that, as impressionable fifth and sixth graders can easily uh, become fearful. But Ohio is at the center of all of this. Ohio is in the middle of it. And these production facilities and the parts of the whole infrastructure to build the weapon systems are spread out across the United States. Much of it is gone. Much of it has been repurposed and turned into something else. But at, the, at its height in the 60s and the 70s, this was a major, major part of the defense complex in the United States. Now, the Navy wanted to play a role as well. And because of the fear that it might be possible still if the Soviets have atomic bombs and atomic missiles and warheads of great power, and great number cranked out like sausages, as Nikita Khrushchev once famously said, then the fear is that perhaps with enough weapons, the Soviets might be able to hit all the airfields, might be able to hit all of the missile silos. But it might be possible to have some of these missiles at sea. And the Navy argued successfully that this could be done and should be done, and that it should have a role in the nuclear mission for the country. So this leads to the development of the submarine-launched ballistic missile. Placed on newly designed missile boats, these Polaris missiles offered what came to be understood as a second strike capability. So long as these boats are at sea, so long as the uh, missiles in them are then hidden from view, 
it's possible to make sure that there will always be a, a second strike capability, always something that will be able to reply if the Soviets launched a surprise attack and hit everything that the United States had at first. There would never be a way of avoiding punishment for hitting the United States successfully. So all three of these systems together come to be known as the nuclear triad. Some 500 strategic bombers at its peak in the 1960s and 70s, 656 submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and some 1,000 ICBMs, if you factor in the Minutemen and the earlier systems. It promised that any war for the United States that became nuclear would involve a spectacular destruction on a worldwide scale. The numbers for us here today really are beyond our understanding. By 1961, the war plan for total nuclear war with the active alert force against the Soviet Union and its allies would have involved the use of at least 1,459 nuclear weapons in a very, very brief period of time. This would involve weapons that were as small, if you can use that, as 10 kilotons and as large as 23 megatons. Some 654 targets would be hit some multiple times, a mixture of military and an urban industrial targets, the Soviet Union would be devastated. In a sustained war, using the entirety of the U.S. nuclear arsenal, the plan was to use more than 3,423 nuclear weapons. And the war gaming done in the 1960s estimated that on the Soviet bloc side, some 285 million Russians and Chinese would die outright, with untold more incapacitated. Again, these are numbers that we can't even begin to fathom, and they were simply in the realm of speculation. Nobody really knew what that would be. And of course, that included the likelihood that the Soviet Union would make its own launches of its missiles, its own attacks with its uh, bombers, and with eventually, once they had constructed them as well, its own missiles launched from submarines. Could such a war be winnable? If the Soviets, with their bombers and missiles and submarine-launched missiles, were able to strike the United States, its harbors, its capital cities, its various military facilities, and the submarine uh, pens, and the silos from which the missiles are launched in the upper Great Plains. All of this need to defend the country against such a nuclear threat to enhance the prospects of winning led to similar fears, but also impressive developments that are even less remembered or appreciated today. And the need for civil defense, the need for some kind of protection of the country and its populace intensified after the development of the super of the thermonuclear weapon. Uh, famously, when the United States government announced the uh, successful detonation of a hydrogen bomb in 1954, the New York Times uh, ran with this in a helpful graphic designed to show just how powerful the explosion was and the way that the New York Times figured it was best to explain the size of the explosive blast was to depict it on New York City. It's figuring that most people in the area where the people read the New York Times would then understand what the map was that they were looking at. And here you have the headline. And this led to spectacular fear because immediately then people said, well, if the Soviets have it, one bomb will destroy that much of New York and its surroundings. What are you going to do to keep us from dying? So the Eisenhower administration worried as much about the offensive capability as it did about the defensive capability and about civil defense. So let's take a look at the civil defense side. The massive civil defense, sorry, the mass of air defense network that's created here is in many ways the forgotten part of the, uh, the nuclear legacy, the forgotten part of the U.S. embrace of the possibility of nuclear war. And what I'm going to show you here um, is enormous and gone in large parts. And so you should appreciate, as we look at these subsequent pictures, the slides from the time, it's just how much money is involved in constructing the systems and maintaining the systems and then supplanting the systems when new technologies come along. So the primary concern was to make sure that Soviet bombers would not reach the United States. Uh, the United States does not have a great deal of confidence that the Soviets have a massive bomber force until the middle of the 1950s, and even then they're not entirely sure just how capable of this Soviet bomber force is. But nonetheless, the fear that the Soviets might somehow attack the United States over the poles or somehow across the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans 
leads to um, renewed interest in detection and interception of that potential bomber force. And so what we see is a system designed for a war that is never fought. A spectacular investment first in detection systems, then in information management, in communications technology, and also in interceptors designed to stop the bombers once they reach first the continental United States, and then really uh, the whole North American continent. So in the two decades after World War II, the United States and then the Canadian partners will build successive lines of radar networks. There is lash up. There is a permanent system that will be constructed subsequently. There would be the Pine Tree and the Mid-Canada Line and then the Distant Early Warning Line. And all of these move, I'm going to jump back here, successively farther and farther to the north. So if this was the original system designed to stop Soviet bombers from coming in into the industrial uh, centers of the United States, aircraft production centers of the United States, or the center of uh, the uh, in initial nuclear mission, gradually begins to move farther north as the realization is that the true attack will come across the pole. And so in order to protect the United States, it means that we have to build radar systems in Canada. Fortunately, the Canadians are in NATO and are willing to accept this. They will build some themselves and the United States will pay for others. But that's not far in north enough. So as the line is moved still farther and farther and farther north, the Mid-Canada line, Pine Tree line, and then eventually we have the construction of the distant early warning line up here designed to detect as absolutely early as possible these inbound Soviet bombers. This means developing fantastic new techniques for construction in places where no one ever envisioned to construct heavy structures. No one ever envisioned having to maintain people living in that area for an extended period of time or operating equipment that would have to deal with extreme temperatures. It also then led to the realization that there were holes that for as much as these distant early warning stations could provide coverage, there were going to be other places not covered and the shortfall there would be made up with aircraft equipped with radar designed to help establish more of a picture at sea and then ships which would go out on very lonely missions running racetrack patterns in the North Atlantic and the Pacific simply trying to detect if any Soviet bombers were coming and though it was classified very highly at the time but released after the Cold War is over there would be other mechanisms designed to try to identify and track and keep track of uh, the Soviet submarine fleet as it would come out from Soviet bases well up in the North Atlantic and the Arctic and down into the Atlantic. If the U.S. could keep track of those, it might be able to negate some of the Soviet advantages here in its second strike capability. All of this, though, is simply about detection. The important thing that one has to be able to do is to process all of this. And again, for some of you, you were involved in this, but others, the full range, the full complexity is now really, really forgotten by the average American who is not going to have any exposure to any of this uh, at all. So the movement and the processing of the information, bringing it back from the detection places, from the long range radar sites, from the picket ships, all of that back into what becomes a direction system is incredibly, incredibly complicated. The information will move by radar, sorry, by radio, which puts pressure on the existing radio spectrum. In the 1950s, based on the uh, archival materials that I found in the Eisenhower Library, the Eisenhower administration had a very difficult set of decisions that it had to make as the demands for uh, the portions of the radio spectrum used for radar pressed more and more in on uh, the burgeoning broadcast television uh, parts of the bandwidth. At one point in a document that I found, they said, we're going to have to decide between radar and television, which is that we're going to actually prioritize. We may have to cut back on television in order to protect the country. So the Air Force constructs ever more complicated processing systems culminating in what is the SAGE system, uh, a massive computer-based air defense infrastructure that tracks the intruders, networks the detectors, 
and vectors the interceptors on where those threats will likely be in the future. Perhaps old hat today, but in the time of the 1950s, in the memory of those uh, then who had seen the beginnings of this in World War II, this is simply fantastic stuff. Now, how do you stop the Soviets coming in with their nuclear weapons? There would be a similarly complicated infrastructure there. It involved using missiles, such as the BOMARC or the Nike missile series, or manned aircraft such as the F-102 or F-106. And we now forget that there was this whole legacy surrounding the major industrial centers of the United States of these missiles, the Nike system with their underground um, storage areas that protected the Dayton, Cincinnati area and protected Cleveland and indeed protected much of the country. There were some 250 of these Nike installations and dozens and dozens of aircraft squadrons all around the country. And all of this equipment is gone. It's been repurposed. It's been sold on. There are museums that you can go and see this quaint system that no longer exists, but once was incredibly important in the face of a fear that the Soviets might use their atomic weapons against the United States. Their thermonuclear weapons brought by bomber capable of wrecking enormous destruction on the infrastructure of the United States. We also forget as well that these weapon systems, whether the Nikes or the air interceptors, were more often than not equipped with atomic warheads designed to destroy incoming Soviet bomber formations. They could have conventional warheads, but they generally were expected to have atomic warheads. And so there was, though now forgotten, an expectation that the defense of the country in its skies would have involved aerial nuclear war. So we forget all of this. It's not in front of us. It's, it's gone. But through the 1960s and on into the early 1970s, the fear of a nuclear war helped to spur the civil defense movement. The idea that such a war might be survivable, winnable, manageable. There still are, across the country, some of the preserved personal fallout shelters that uh, from time to time appear in the press as a new homeowner discovers that there is such a thing uh, that had been boarded up and forgotten. Um, we also still see on public buildings from the Dayton area to Greenville to New York City, the quaint sign, the fallout shelter sign, where there still are in the basement of some of them supplies that have been long forgotten about. So the underlying tenets are valuable. The organizational and intellectual descendants of the civil defense movement in the 1960s and 70s um, are FEMA and the planning for hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes that we all prudently do. It became increasingly clear to senior political leaders as early as Eisenhower in 1953, then to Johnson, then and Kennedy, and then on to those afterwards, that you couldn't really win a nuclear war that in Eisenhower's famous phrase, the living would envy the dead in the aftermath of what had happened. But we now understand that President Dwight Eisenhower's commitment to massive retaliation and the idea that the strategy for dealing with nuclear war and the, and the threat of that with the Soviet Union was to promise that any provocation by the Soviet Union would result in an immediate and total use of all of America's nuclear power. That we would go all in and we would utterly destroy the Soviet Union was his way of controlling escalation. It was his way of avoiding war altogether because he knew that as long as he had that threat, and as long as he knew that the decision remained in his hands, he could trust himself never to use the weapons. As long as he could threaten to use them, he could trust that the Soviets then would be fearful that the only war would be a massive retaliation nuclear war and they would choose not to go to war either. So this was a risky approach, but Eisenhower's approach none the way, nonetheless. By the time that we reach the 1960s, once both sides have built up their arsenals to these spectacular levels that on the US side I've already mentioned, once both sides possess second strike systems, it's clear that neither the United States nor the Soviet Union will be able to escape destruction on a scale that would threaten not only their individual countries, but really world civilization. And thus, we have the phrase mutually assured destruction. If both were going to die, 
and both could be confident that they would each have an interest in avoiding this and would take all steps that they could to avoid it. Nuclear war, it seemed, was thus a permanent danger, but a deeply undesirable policy choice for all sides. And yet, there would still be nuclear weapons, there would still be expanding arsenals, and there would still be that great fear. So let's turn then to the impact on international affairs. Our second theme is a more problematic one. What impact did nuclear weapons have on international affairs? Again, we can spend an enormous amount of time exploring this, but three different observations come to mind. The first is that the presence of nuclear weapons and the fear of their collective use helps to suppress great power conflict in the rest of the 20th century. And I emphasize here great power conflict, for of course, there were lots of wars in other parts of the world, but the United States and the Soviet Union do not follow on what had happened in Europe twice in the generations before. There is no World War III. The United States and the Soviet Union planned unceasingly to go to war with each other. There were plans for all-out nuclear attacks. There were plans for selected use of nuclear weapons on the battlefield as part of limited escalation. There were plans for controlled strategic uses in ways that perhaps might allow the war to stop, assuming there were people still alive to stop the war. But the risks of war had now become so great that ultimately the war remains a cold one between the two superpowers and between the two alliances, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. To be sure, there were times, in fact, two key ones during the Cold War, when it seemed like nuclear war might actually break out. <coughs> Excuse me. The first is, as you all know, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, Nikita Khrushchev's decision to emplace nuclear weapons, not just nuclear-tipped missiles, but we now understand other forms of nuclear weapons in Cuba, was done to guarantee the survival of Fidel Castro's new regime to make the U.S. feel the same kind of pressure that the Soviets felt from the Jupiter Intermediate Range missiles in Turkey, and to gain leverage for further discussions over the fate of the divided Berlin and the reconciliation, perhaps, of East and West Germany. The U.S. learned of the missile emplacements and the standoff that occurs. Ultimately, the Soviets will blink and agree not to force the U.S. naval quarantine line around Cuba. A secret deal is done whereby both sides will withdraw nuclear weapons, the Soviets from Cuba and the U.S. the missiles in Turkey, which were slated to be withdrawn anyway. But both sides will avoid any um, assumption that this is a quid pro quo and will deny that to the public. There's no public acknowledgement of a trade. Historians have subsequently learned about a great number of near misses during the crisis itself, where a single decision that went the wrong way could have begun the shooting and triggered a war from accidental um, incursions into Soviet airspace from um, no one getting people in Florida to stop testing um, space rockets and space missiles coming up out of Cape Canaveral, uh, which looked suspiciously like also coming up out of Cuba, uh, to incidents of dropping um, low power depth charges on Soviet submarines that were known to be accompanying the Soviet merchant vessels approaching the quarantine line without anybody knowing that the Soviet commander aboard had atomic um, torpedoes and that the decision was two to two to one uh, in uh, against uh, using the atomic torpedoes against the US uh, destroyers um, to my personal favorite um, a bear accidentally triggering a, a perimeter alarm at an airfield um, at an air base along the Canadian border, uh, which uh, led to the scrambling of uh, air defense fighters, which would have then gone up and encountered uh, US B-52 bombers that were coming back on a circle pattern and might potentially have resulted in an air-to-air -air combat situation by accident. Um, ultimately, somebody figured out it was a bear and not saboteurs coming across the wire. But all of these different sorts of things individually seem silly, uh, quaint, unusual, but collectively, uh, could have, if gone the wrong way, triggered the outbreak of war. The other much less well-known event was during the fall of 1983 and the Able Archer exercise of NATO. It occurred within a backdrop of steadily deteriorating U.S.-Soviet relations following the failure of the detente uh, policies of the 1970s, um, the development of new um, nuclear missile systems with multiple independently targeted warheads, the famous MIRVs, uh, 
that made each individual missile much more versatile and dangerous. The U.S. had the te this technology and the Soviets had not yet uh, developed it effectively. And the deployment of new shorter range missiles by both sides in Europe, uh, the SS-20s and the perishing two uh, missiles in Europe, which had a very short time from launch to impact uh, relative to that of the ballistic missiles that both sides had that were intercontinental. So by 1983, there's escalating bellicose rhetoric from the Reagan administration about the um, illegitimacy of the Soviet regime. Additionally, President Reagan had announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, a goal of a system to protect the United States and others from the danger of ballistic missiles that, if it became operational, might potentially negate the Soviet nuclear threat entirely. And this magnified irrational fears within the aging Soviet leadership particularly former KGB head and now Premier Yuri Andropov, that the United States was preparing for preventative nuclear war to destroy the Soviet Union completely. By the fall of 1983, the Soviet leadership had convinced itself that the U.S. was willing to risk nuclear war and would use an excuse to begin it. Now, that excuse might well have been, in their view, the annual November Able Archer exercise, intended this year to include the practice of nuclear release guidance and the removal of senior leadership in the West to nuclear bunkers to practice the whole process of command and control uh, between civilians and military in the event of some kind of nuclear event. As the Soviets had in the past used exercises as cover for their own actual military operations, they projected this then onto the West. Some officials assumed the worst and began to contemplate preemptive nuclear attacks on the West. On September 26, 1983, an error in the Soviet nuclear warning system alerted Soviet officials that there were inbound nuclear missiles coming at the Soviet Union. The Soviet watchstander, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov, decided in his gut that this had to be an error. This had to be a system malfunction and was not real, and so he did not trigger the immediate nuclear retaliation plan. This is in then the milieu of the, the fears that in October and November is this exercise preparing that perhaps there might be a real there there. And so when the November exercise occurs, tensions are very high in the Soviet Union. Through emergency back channel messages to the Reagan White House, Soviets who feared that this was all a misunderstanding success, succeeded in warning the West that the perception of danger was high, higher than the West might actually understand. And while the full picture remains unclear to us, cloaked in um, security uh, classified information, cloaked in uh, Soviet sources that we don't fully have or, or are able to, to see. Um, the understanding that we now have is that this played the whole naval archer exercise tension, played a key role in leading Ronald Reagan towards the decision to reduce tensions with the Soviet Union in 1984, and more so once Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. So it's an important moment. Some historians believe that we were very, very close to nuclear war. Others dismiss it, feeling that this is um, overblown in some ways. It will take some time for us to understand the full uh, weight of it. But given the enormous nuclear arsenals on both sides, the consequences of a misunderstanding getting out of control here could have been quite, quite catastrophic. But it's important for us to appreciate that as dangerous as these two situations were, they were the exceptions, not the norm. Through the Cold War and beyond, the United States and the Soviet Union were not about to go to war. They were preparing, but the danger was never as great as it was in those two moments. We also would see times when the United States and others would seek to move past the nuclear race, move past the dependence on the atom for destruction. Uh, famously, Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s had proposed that the U.S help countries around the world find alternate forms of use of the atom, the famous Atoms for Peace program. And this would help spur the spread of nuclear power and nuclear research and other uses for the atom to countries around the world. But if general war between the superpowers was now unlikely, a second great impact of nuclear weapons on international affairs was the unexpected encouragement of guerrilla or unconditional conventional warfare. The continued need to prepare for war with the Soviet Union and the desire to avoid letting any war on the periphery escalate to general war with the entirety of the Soviet bloc placed political and economic and military limits on what the United States could do to ensure the success of its anti-communist allies in Africa and in Asia. 
And as a result, the guerrilla warfare strategy of Mao Zedong could deliberately exploit the unwillingness of the U.S. or other capitalist Western powers to commit total resources or extended time to defeat an insurgency. Instead, there would be proxy wars and limited conflicts. As a consequence, the Cold War became, in the middle 20th century, a hot one for many countries in Asia and Africa, and millions died in these conflicts. And a third great impact of nuclear weapons upon international politics is that it gave rise to the belief that possession of nuclear weapons guaranteed national survival against existential threats. Despite efforts at non-proliferation, over the 20th century, more and more states joined the nuclear club after Britain and the Soviet Union developed their weapons. <coughs> the French, to protect themselves from being tied to NATO and the United States entirely, would develop their own nuclear force. The Chinese, did it to protect themselves against both the West and the Soviet Union. It's generally understood that the Israelis did something similar. South Africa and Brazil explored nuclear weapons. Perhaps the Saudis have started to do so. And notably, both India and Pakistan did, out of a fear of the other. And we know that Iran and Iraq and North Korea have all pursued it as well, the North Koreans likely successfully. Some scholars have argued that this is a good thing, that it has helped to enhance world peace that more nuclear weapons serve as a stabilizing factor in international relations. Others disagree. Some have raised the concern, first in the 1970s, that the security of the weapons stockpile is the key issue, that the true horror might result from a non-state actor successfully stealing one of these devices and setting it off for whatever particular political purpose they had in mind. So what then might we see as the lasting legacies of the use of the atomic bombs on Japan to end World War II and the subsequent nuclear age from 1945 to the present. Well, peace and deterrence for sure. Though the U.S. experienced smaller wars, the presence of the bomb meant the absence of great power conflict that had extended from 1945 to the present. And some would argue that it helps to prevent the United States and China from pursuing direct kinetic violence. That might, however, privilege some other forms of conflict economic or social, unconventional, cyber, that might have different untold forms of pain for all sides in a war. Another is the lasting concern with radioactivity. Look at how much anxiety surrounded the risk of a dirty bomb. In the aftermath of 9-11, um, <clears throat> the concern that an explosive device wrapped with a radioactive material might cause the destruction of an economic center of a city or the removal of the ability of people to be in a city at all. This gives rise to the supposition that Saddam Hussein had not ended his pursuit of a nuclear weapon, that perhaps this might open up a new horrific element in the war on terrorism. For another, the great anxieties over the environmental effects of nuclear weapons production, from Hanford, Washington, to Savannah River, South Carolina, here in Ohio, and other places, the concern that the lasting damage done in the pursuit of this weapon system that has protected us for these many years has also harmed us in ways that we don't fully appreciate. For all of our concerns, however, this pales in comparison with what little we truly know about the environmental impact of nuclear weapons materials in the former Soviet Union. And third, and finally, let me offer a contrarian point of view to spur further reflection. We remember the 20th century as a time of discovery about the power of the atom. And from that, and given all that we have just discussed, we consider the power of the split atom to have been of the highest significance. But perhaps there's an alternate consideration. Perhaps it was the power of the electron, not the split nucleus, that came to matter more. Spurred by the need to know what the Soviets were doing. Driven by the fear of the Soviets having the bomb. Committed to the creation of offensive and defensive systems of the armed forces considered essential for a war that never came, the U.S. military helped to accelerate a spectacular exploitation of the electromagnetic spectrum and the development of the electronics industry in the United States and by extension through much of the world. While the Internet may not exactly have been the invention of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the origins of so much of our electronic life lie in the technological solutions to particular problems spurred by the Cold War and the concern that the Soviets uh, have an atomic weapon, that the United States may face an atomic war, and that the destruction of the Earth through thermonuclear weapons use is something that requires these systems to be made ready at their highest capability. And that, in the end, may be one of the most amazing legacies of the atomic bomb and the Cold War that followed it. Thank you very much for the opportunity.
And with that, back to Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I certainly appreciate the breadth that you covered of a, of a very diversified aspect of, of nuclear weapons and technology. And I want to point out that those here, we have recorded this presentation and we'll upload it onto YouTube on the Mount Science and Energy Museum uh, webpage. It will be available to, to, to see again or to share with, with your friends or interested parties. Uh, also, uh, Jonathan has graciously uh, agreed to accept questions. You can, uh, if you don't have his email address from what we have now, you can contact us at the museum. We will forward them to you and give you an opportunity to, to probe. There's obviously a lot more detail that would be to, to cover. And uh, so please take advantage of that. Now, our next seminar. We also be a webinar and that will be on the fourth Wednesday of September, which I believe is twenty seventh, twenty second. I'm not looking at my calendar right now. I've lost track of it. But uh, uh, what we're going to have is uh, Dr. Don Sollinger two years ago gave a history, personal history of the founding of the Mount. Science and Energy Museum back in 1998 for nearly 25 years. Uh, so this uh, mound museum uh, was, was started and, and preserved up until uh, the time we transitioned into Dayton history now operates the museum uh, in Mimersburg. And so this is, uh, Don has agreed to the introduction. We will do an introduction. Uh, there and so that will be at our, our next webinar. We will send out an announcement with details on how to join uh, a, a week or ten days before the meeting. So I want to thank everybody for coming in uh, and and participating and, and, and listening to information from Professor Winkler. And with that, I think we'll close. And you all have a great evening and best wishes to everyone. Thank you.